Hello, this is Texas PK, and welcome to another installment of Noobstone, where we take a simplified look at how redstone components work, to where it's not only easier to build, but understand different redstone contraptions. Today we're going to be taking a look at the fundamentals of redstone, so we can get a foundation built up to understand some of the more complicated things in redstone. Basically, there are three different classifications of redstone. There are power components, which provide the different redstone power to all of our contraptions. There are transmission components, which transmit the power from one place to another or modify that signal. Then there are the mechanical components, which are activated by a redstone signal. Today, we're gonna to be taking a look at redstone power components. So let's get started. As of version 1.17, there are a total of 15 power components in Minecraft Bedrock Edition. You can see each one of them laid out here to, and before you. The first one is the redstone torch, a block of redstone, a lever, there's the button, both stone and wood types. There are pressure plates, both wood and stone types. There are weighted pressure plates, both light and heavy. There's the daylight sensor. There's a trap chest. You can tell the difference between a trap chest and a regular chest by the little red square around the latch. There's activator rails, lightning rods, target blocks, lecterns, observers, tripwire hooks, and jukeboxes. Now jukeboxes are only a power component in Bedrock Edition. Sorry, Java players. But who knows, one day they might be added into the Java as well. Now the back two rows of power components are a little more complicated and involved and are better understood in the context of other devices. So we will not be looking at those today. We will be starting with just the basic power components and looking at how each one of these interact and supply power to our redstone devices. So let's get started with the redstone block and the redstone torch. Now an important consideration to keep in mind is to remember that redstone power components can provide a power level anywhere from 0, which is off, to 15, which is its maximum signal strength. Both the redstone torch and the block of redstone provide maximum power output of 15 signal strength, which basically means that they have enough power to transmit through 15 pieces of redstone dust and still have enough power to activate a redstone component. Now in all of these examples that we'll be using today, we will be using redstone lamps just because it makes it easy to see them. But all of these principles work no matter what kind of device it is, as long as it can be activated by a redstone signal. Now if both of these components, the redstone torch and the redstone block, can provide a full signal strength, you might ask why would you use either one over the other? When constructing a redstone torch, it only takes one stick and one piece of redstone dust, where a redstone block requires nine pieces of redstone dust. At first glance, it might seem that the redstone torch would always be preferred because it's more cost effective. But there are situations where each is preferred. For example, if you were to use a piston on a redstone torch, you notice it is not moved. It is broken and dropped as an item. Whereas if we were to use a piston on a redstone block, it is moved. And it, if it's a sticky piston, it'll even return it back to its original position. Basically, this means you can use a redstone block as an on-off switch for an automatic circuit. Another difference is that a redstone torch is toggleable. What this basically means is that if it is powered by a redstone signal, it will be turned off. Let me demonstrate what this means. If we come over to this block and add a redstone torch to it, you'll see that it turns on a redstone lamp. But if we were then to power this redstone torch, it then turns it off. Hence, it is toggleable. Try and say that three times fast. Now, an interesting implication of being able to toggle a redstone torch with a redstone signal is that you could see where there might be a way for a redstone torch to turn itself off, which would create an infinite loop. Let me demonstrate what this means. If you were to place a redstone torch on this block here, it powers this block, which would power this redstone dust, which would power this block, which would then turn off this redstone torch, which means then that this block is no longer powered. That means this redstone dust is no longer powered, which means this block is no longer powered, which means this redstone torch would turn back on and create an infinite loop that would never end. 
Of course, you just saw it turn off. So what's happening? Of course, an infinite loop like that could cause some serious problems for your world, creating great lag, or possibly even crashing a server. So Mojang built in a safety precaution, which prevents this from happening. As you noticed, after 1.6 seconds, it turns off. And it is 1.6 seconds. I timed it multiple times, recording it in my videos and counting the number of frames before it turned off. It's 1.6 seconds. This is called a redstone torch burnout. The cycle only is allowed to go through a few times before it stops the infinite loop. The only way in which it can be restarted is if you were to break that torch and reset it, or to update a block on one side of this torch. You can update that redstone torch by placing another redstone component, or by placing even a standard regular block, or even by removing any of those components. This burnout prevents the infinite loop from ever happening and protects your world. Now one thing you might want to notice is that even though this is a flickering on and off cycle, the redstone lamp above it doesn't flicker on and off. It stays lit the entire time before the burnout occurs. Once the redstone lamp burns out, it stays off. But while it's going through the cycle, it stays on. The next components we want to take a look at are the levers and buttons. Both levers and buttons provide full power when they're activated. The difference is that when a lever is activated, it will stay on until it is deactivated by the player. Whereas a button automatically will turn off after a refresh time. For stone buttons, and this is true for regular stone buttons and black stone buttons, the refresh rate is one second. Whereas for wood buttons, and again, this is true for all types of wood buttons, including the warped and the crimson buttons, the delay is 1.5 seconds. A couple of interesting things to note about these is that a lever will always put its off position to the south or to the east direction. Doesn't matter which way you face, it always is either south or east. Also, if you place it in the vertical position, the off position is always up. Now, to me, this is a little confusing. Uh, I don't know if this is an American thing. In the United States, the off position is usually down. So an interesting thing you can do is to use the fact that you can toggle a redstone torch to reverse the direction that is the off position. All you have to do is attach this to the block, have the redstone torch on the back, and now the off position is down. Another interesting feature is that stone buttons are not affected by arrows, but wood buttons are. This is kind of a neat way to where what you could do is if you wanted to, if you're riding a horse or running into your base really quickly trying to escape from a mob, you could shoot an arrow at a button for your door and activate it, and it will stay there until either they're picked up or they despawn after five minutes. Now in order to use this you'd have to be a really good shot, but it is a feature of wood buttons. The next power component we want to take a look at are pressure plates. There are two varieties of standard pressure plates. There are the stone pressure plates and there are wood pressure plates. Both of these, when stepped upon by a player or a mob, provide full signal strength of 15. The difference between a stone pressure plate and a wood pressure plate is that in addition to being activated by mobs, wooden pressure plates are also activated by items, whereas the stone pressure plates are not. This can be particularly useful if you're wanting to set up an automatic door opener for your base and you don't want to have items accidentally opening the door, you would want to use stone pressure plates. Whereas if you want to have something that might use a dropper or a dispenser to activate a signal, you could use a wooden pressure plate. Also, wooden pressure plates are able to be activated with arrows as well, but the stone ones aren't. The next power component we want to take a look at are weighted pressure plates. These act in a similar fashion to the wooden pressure plate, except that they do not put out a full signal strength automatically. They both are activated by players or mobs that step onto them, and they also are activated by items that might be dropped onto them. The difference between them is this. Whether you drop one 
or two or three or any number of items, it always puts out a signal strength of one only. Whereas if you were to do this with the light pressure plate, it gives out a signal strength for every unique item that falls on it. So you notice I've thrown six items onto this pressure plate. It has a signal strength of six. Now there is one interesting kind of quirk to this, and I believe it is an intended game mechanic, and that is that no matter how many items of the same type you drop, it will not give you the maximum signal strength. However, you'll notice it went up to four just then, but then it went down to one. The reason for this is that when you drop an item of the same type, initially it looks like two items, but then because they're in close proximity, in order to save on memory, the game groups them as a single item of two of the same type. This saves on memory, but it also makes it a little hard for you to use the light weighted pressure plate to do any sort of counting of items. However, because arrows are individual items that are not stacked when they're out on the field, you can shoot as many arrows into a pressure plate and it'll count every single one of them all the way up to 15. Now the only reason I could think you might want to do that is if you wanted to count how many times something happened and you were using a dispenser to shoot arrows into one of these light weighted pressure plates and use it to turn on lamps to count how many times something happened for you. But other than that I can't think of a reason off the top of my head you might want to. But it is something that can be done and perhaps you can come up with an idea that might be pretty cool. If you do, let me know. I'd like to hear about it. And that's it. Everything you need to know about the basics of redstone power components, at least the front row of them. Like I said earlier, the second and third row devices are a little more complicated and they need to have their own tutorials on each one of them specifically. So if there's one in particular you'd like to know more about, leave a comment down below and let us know which one you're interested in hearing more about and perhaps we can do one in a future video soon. But that's it for today. So I hope you enjoyed the tutorial and that it helps you out in understanding better how the basics of redstone work. But on that note, I'd like to say thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again in the next one. But until then, this is Texas PK. Be good to each other. Bye!